Today's podcast is brought to you by our longtime sponsor, simplyfaster.com. There's two items I'd like to talk to you about today that you can find in Simply Faster's online store. Whether you're a coach or an athlete, these are both things that you'll find highly useful as tools in your training toolbox. The first is blood flow restriction training methods. And after hearing about blood flow restriction training for years now, as well as the results that athletes are getting with it, especially in, for example, lactate sports like swimming, 100 meter freestyle, and not only hearing of that, but also seeing how much some swimmers had liked that type of training method, I knew I had to start trying it out myself. So I've been utilizing the air bands. I really enjoy it, both the feeling while I'm actually training with them, as well as seeing the visual result of spending time training with the methods and then the strength result. They've been a really cool training tool, and I would definitely recommend checking into air bands. Simplyfaster.com also has B Strong brand blood flow restriction. The second item is the VMAX Pro. And this is a new option for velocity-based training, barbell tracking. It provides valuable load-based data, including speed in all phases of a lift, and it delivers key metrics such as power, velocity, distance, as well as duration of effort. The VMAX Pro system measures any lift you can think of. It's portable, durable, and intuitive. You can check out these two items and much more at our sponsor, simplyfaster.com's online store. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Thanks for being here. So today's show is about zooming out a little bit on the longer term view of athletic development, the view of possibilities in athletic development, and what is, um, what is your worldview? How do you view the whole holistic process of the goal of this thing we call athletic training and performance? I love doing shows where there's nuance and we're getting into like specific biomechanics of speed or compression expan- and expansion and lifting and, and biomechanics. But it's also really important to never get buried. It's always important to always see things from that broad perspective. For the show today, I have a roundtable discussion with three guests who have moved from a little bit more of a structured setting. They were all previously strength coaches in the NCAA in Division I and then moved into the private sector of training. So on the show today, we have Jeremy Frisch, Austin Yoakum, and Jake Tura. Jeremy Frisch is the owner of Achieve Performance Training. Austin Yoakum runs Yoakum Strength. And Jake Tura is the owner of Jacked Athlete. On the show today, these coaches will speak on their path away from the more structured uh, sector or setting of scholastic training, college sports performance, and then how getting into the private sector has allowed them to really continue their evolution and focus on some of the pressing needs that exist in modern sport, such as the lost art of physical education, movement, play, a greater understanding on building robustness and keeping athletes healthy. Whether you're a scholastic or a private coach or wherever you are on that spectrum of sport development, a skills coach, this is a great show to step back and take a more zoomed out perspective on effective training athletes and the greatest needs for athletes for their long-term success. Let's get on to episode 302 with Jeremy Frisch, Austin Yoakum, and Jake Tura. Fellas, it's an honor to have all of you for this uh, little roundtable. I haven't done one of these in a while, but it's fun to have a a show with multiple coaches again. And so for this one, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, kind of moving from more the formal, the the college strength and conditioning setting, more of a structured setting into the private sector. And I want to kick it off by each of you guys telling a little bit of your story on what led you to make the move from college strength and conditioning or athletic performance, moving into the private sector, where it became more of something that you had a little bit more control in creating. Yeah, I, I can take it, I guess, to start. Uh, I was probably the most recent of leaving it. But yeah, I, I was uh, I was the strength coach at St. Thomas for the football team for three years in the Division three sector and then one year at the Division one sector. And I knew probably two years in that I wasn't going to go full-time college. And two years in is when I met Jake, and Jake just continued to water that seed of... A lot of it was like the freedom piece. It's like, you know you should be doing something. You know you should be saying something. And then you have, you're working for admin and you're working for coaches instead of working for the athletes that are in front of you. So that was a big thing for me is working on the process of leaving that college sector. And we started to build up the private sector during that time for the sole purpose of being able to have that freedom to be able to say what you want to say in the, in the kind of constricted world of the college setting. And talking with Jake and uh, Will was another one that they were both just telling me, it's like, just do it. Like, (laughs) just say what you're supposed to say. Cause they're both. Because I, I went into it like with the young gun, like, 
hey, I'm just going to do all these things. And, and, and then I just started to realize, oh, it's like, it's not happening. And Jake was like, yeah, it's not going to unless you say it. It's like, it's not going to get better. And I just kept thinking in my head, it's going to get better until I started to see it, see it, see it. And I'm like, it, it's not getting better. So kind of made the switch because of that. I think the biggest thing for me is in the, the difference between the private sector and the college sector is one in the, the college sector, what you are working for and what you are pleasing and who writes your paychecks is admin and uh, coaches. And you so you have these hundred athletes that you're supposed to be working for, but you're truly not like they're not the ones writing your paychecks. There's just kind of the ones showing up and some of it's babysitting and that. But at the end of the day, you're not really working for them. Whereas if in the private sector, if you set it up, because you can set it up wrong in the private sector as well, where it turns into babysitting in the private sector and you're working for parents that are paying for it. But if you set it up correctly in the private sector with some of the online businesses and just working for the athlete themselves, it gives you a lot more freedom to kind of work with the athlete rather than work for an admin or a sport coach. I, I, I'll go next. Yeah, so the reason I left was, first of all, I think I must have spent like a decade wanting to be a Division One strength coach. And then I got it and I was really happy. And then maybe a couple months in, I'm like, is this it? Like, is this, like, is this all it is? So I was trained in men's women's basketball, which is what I really wanted to do. But it just wasn't enough for me. And then I was making bad money. I'm living in a place I didn't really want to live. And then I met our, we got a new woman soccer coach. And he's a guy who gave those analogies with the matrix and the red pill and the blue pill. And my first meeting with him, I'm like, he's like, what are you going to do with our women's soccer team? And I was like, I'm going to do general strength, one by 20, strength, endurance, work capacity and everything. And then he's like, how are you going to help me put the ball in the back of the net? And I couldn't answer him. And then I, I thought about that for the next year, one year, two years. And finally, it was just like he kind of exposed this idea of why is everything so isolated in sports? Why do we have all these different people that specialize in one thing? It leads to all of these disconnects and people having egos and this doesn't make any sense. And then I, I, over time, thinking about that, actually, Joel talking with you when I came to Cincinnati, uh, I just put in my brain to be like, man, I need to leave because I can make better money if I work online or if I work privately. And I don't have to deal with all that garbage. And personally now, too, for me, is like I, I really care about the patellar tendon, about vertical jump, and about muscle gain. And I can focus on those things, and people can come to me who are interested in those. But if I work at the university, I have 100 athletes who might not be interested at all in that. <clears throat> I might have like a woman swimmer who wants to get a, who knows, who knows why she, what, what she thinks of the weight room, you know? So it's a lot easier for me now because I don't have to sacrifice. I don't have to kind of <clears throat> meet people in the middle. It's more like, here's what I have to offer. You can come to me and, and get that. So that was kind of my journey of <clears throat> why I left. Yeah. So for me, it was uh, kind of both ends of the spectrum. Like I had a, my son was born. We brought him to the doctor. He told us that uh, he's not like moving or crawling enough. And at some point you're going to have to bring him somewhere for some type of like intervention. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, I work with athletes all the time. I can do this stuff. So I started reading a lot about phys ed and things like that, just to kind of, you know, so I could do that, that stuff with my kids. But then at the same time, when I got to the college level, I sort of, I don't know, my first like probably month there, I realized like, a lot of athletes had limitations that I wasn't going to fix. And so over time, that sort of kind of got to me. And I was like, I can go back and really make a difference if I'm working with like kind of younger athletes. And so that was like where the ball started rolling for me. It was like, you know, work with younger athletes, develop them through the years. And then at the same time, now I have this great place for my children to go and learn those things. So that's kind of how it all happened for me. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, how long, I know um, Austin and Jake, you guys are a little bit more recent, but Jeremy, how long has it been since you uh, moved on from the college sector and started your own thing with the younger athletes? Well, and everybody you trained, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's been 12, 12 years since so we've sort of been going. Ironically, though, it's funny. I started up when I started the private gym, I got calls two se on two separate occasions. I like sort of went back and was kind of a part-time strength and conditioning coach. Sort of, I so I, the original place I was at was the College of the Holy Cross, and but then there's there's like eleven other colleges in that city in, inside Worcester. Um, so after I opened up my facility, I got a few calls from just because I knew people around the area, and I got to work with a few basketball teams, one at Assumption College and one at WPI. So I was sort of like for a little bit doing both, which was nice because I sort of they gave me a little bit more freedom because they didn't have like a real strength and conditioning program inside like their school. It wasn't like Obviously, Holy Cross is 
you know, very embedded and they have an entire weight room, you know, and, and uh, training facility. But these other schools were a little bit smaller, Division two and Division three, and they didn't really have like sort of a dedicated strength and conditioning program. So I got to come in. I mean, the facilities were god awful, but kind of that was kind of the beauty of it. We had some medicine balls and a few dumbbells and a few bars, and we sort of just went at it in some open space. So I kind of got to do things that the way I wanted to do rather than kind of how I got, you know, how, how your typical, you know, college strength conditioning program is run, is run you know, cause when I was there at Holy Cross, I was, uh, God, I had 15 teams, you know, <laughs> throughout the year. So it's like, there's just so many athletes and, you know, you obviously see things that they may need, but time constraints with their classes and, and seasons and, and practices and stuff like that, you're not, you're not getting to, to help them all that much. You know what I mean? So it was nice to be able to be in a college setting where you just have to deal with one team, but you know, those things never last. It was always like a short contract. And then both schools ended up sort of getting their own full-time strength coach. But yeah, so it's been 12 years since I've been, I've been, uh, I've been out, you know, officially from the college of the Holy Cross. It sounds like the, kind of almost the, the resounding theme in some ways is always, I don't know, like the more compartments there are in a university or a, an athletic department, like it's almost like the more specialized your job becomes, the more constrained it is. I mean, you can maybe take this into motor learning and constraints and things like that, but the, the less degrees of freedom that you have. And I, I think it just b- makes it a lot more difficult. I do think that you know, there's, I mean, I'm sure you guys had coaches like Jake, you said that you know, there's a soccer coach that was a really progressive thinker. And I'm sure you really enjoyed working with that coach. And I think there's always going to be coaches that we can fit with really well on the, and grow with, and we gain trust on the the college sector. But then I, I think there's also going to be coaches that you could do the best job you possibly could. You could maybe have the best like workload or data print out and it just, and you show that to the coach and it's just nothing. I think it's very possible for to do all this extra work on the level of the strength and conditioning coach and not see any of it or not on any of it, but see a lot of it just kind of be kind of tossed to the wayside a little bit. And so to me, it's interesting the way that the, those universities are structured from just a just a not even like the fault of the coaches but even just the way it's set up in some ways you know maybe if they change the labels of the job title a little bit or or the expectation and i know as well this is the last thing i'll say is austin i I found it very interesting something you said on the podcast you and jake did about quitting the industry is it's like a lot of times those sport coaches they just want it's not really an integration it's more like, hey, you're the strength coach. Hey, can you do this cool like Theragun thing? Or can you do this like extra thing to get this athlete this extra thing? It's never tied into the meat and the potatoes. It's always this like bonus. Like, can you put this cherry on top here or there? You know what I'm saying? Like, I think there's just so much in the way that it's all structured, really, that that's more universal that way I see it. Yeah. Well, and that, you talked about tossing stuff to the wayside. And we talked about this on Jake's podcast. It's like, that was my head going in. Like, it's like, okay, we're going to periodize. We're going to do high, low. Like we're going to get all these perfect volumes. And then it'll be so like when we were division three specifically, we're like, we'd go four months without playing football and we'd be able to do some volume and some change of direction, but we're not playing football. We have no pads on. And, but we'd plan it all out. All these, the guys bodies would be feeling great. They would talk about this. And then day one, we were allowed to put pads on. We would go three hour practice, full go like zero ramp up into it. So it's like, we, we always talk about this high, low model. We always talk about how perfectly periodized our programs are. And it's like, that doesn't mean shit. If we go to practice, we run four days in a row of high days, you know, like four days in a row, we haven't played football in a year after COVID. And then we just go in and run a full practice. You know, that was a really frustrating part about me is like, you're putting all this effort into all these points. And then you just realize like, oh man, none of that really mattered. Like it was just such a waste of time. And a lot of regards It's like, yeah, you could have did worse in the offseason. You could have hurt them more in the offseason or have them on more unprepared. But it's like at the end of the day, like if they're going to toss it out when we go to practice, like it, it, it really doesn't matter. And then like you're, to your point with the Theraguns and stuff like that, it's like so then your job becomes, OK, you, you, we know like we're really not preventing injuries in what we do because the injuries are happening from this huge volume spikes and these injuries are happening from contact issues or just a very physical sport. And we're not paying attention to meat and potatoes. So what do we have to like? How do we have to earn our jobs? We have to earn our jobs with new tools. We have to earn our jobs with new shiny things that we bring to a sport coach. And I posted something on it yesterday. But it's literally like if an alien were to look at it, we'd look like such idiots. It's like, ooh, like new shiny toy sport coach. Like before it was foam rollers, then it was lacrosse balls, and now it's their guns. But it, it's just over and over again. It's just how do you keep your job? How do you keep the sport coach looking like you're engaged? Like the sport coach, you want the sport coach smiling down at you. 
And if you bring him a shiny tool and then you have him, you use it on a star running back, he's like, oh yeah, that feels good in the moment. Then you have a purpose for being there and you have a reason to earn your paycheck for another week. So that, that, that was just something that I continued to see. And as we went from div- division three to division one, it only got worse because we brought in more people and we brought in more specialists and it was more people. Okay. This person's the hip person. This person's a yoga person. This person's the Theragun person. This go- person's the mini band person. And it just got worse and worse. And we're just not looking at the global scheme of things. It's like we're running 32 hours of practice a week. And these guys haven't practiced before. And we just came off COVID, you know, like the big stuff. We don't want to fix the big stuff because the big stuff's hard to fix. We want to bring in new shiny toys with what we're doing. Yeah, I had a, I think for me, like I, I think I had six or seven coaches and I was on a pretty good page with most of them. Like we, we kind of got to the, a common ground where it was like, let's keep athletes fresh. Let's do things that make sense in the weight room as far as it relates to sport. Uh, but then the person that is above everyone is our, our athletic director. And I run into him in the hallway and I don't know when it was, maybe it was like middle of the basketball season. And all he says to me is he's like, are the athletes getting stronger? And it was just like, that's what you think of me. It's like, I'm just here to get athletes stronger, you know, and it just that disconnect, that disconnect of having someone who is your boss writing your check. And they look at me as the guy that gets the athlete stronger. And it's like, I'm doing like, at least I think I'm doing so much more than that. And I'm trying to help these teams be successful. And strength is maybe one component. But yeah, just man, it it really was um, unrewarding to have to work for people that are above you that think that way. So I, that was one of the big reasons I really wanted to get out. Can I branch off on that? Cause it was, it was probably two or three years ago. We played a team that took second in the nation for football. They were, they were, they were, they were runners up. They lost the national championship game and their rivals. They had two NFL draft picks and four NFL players on their team as a division three team, so which is pretty ridiculous of a division three team. We lost to them by a touchdown in a game and that we were in the game the entire time. We lost to them by a touchdown. And we go, uh, I have a meeting with my athlete, one of the athletic directors after it. And we had a whole sit down. He's just like, our guys just were not big enough on that field. They were not big enough to go through. I was like, dude, like they like, what are we, what the fuck are we like? Oh, sorry. What are we talking about here? Like, what are we saying in this meeting right here? Like this dude hasn't worked. I promise you, he hasn't worked out in 10 years. I doesn't know the difference between a bicep and tricep. We are playing four NFL picks. We were within a game. We should have had no business being in. Their left tackle was a fourth. He, he starts for the Jaguars right now, Ben Barge. He's 6'9", 380 pounds. Like, you recruit me a 6'9 guy, we can build that. But, like, we're to have this meeting afterwards, and that's where your head is at. Like, that's where the blame's going in that game of the guys weren't big enough. It's like our starting defensive end at the time was 5'8", uh, and, like, 235. <laughs> this is a Division three defensive end, like, going against this monster. It's like, what do we talk? We can do all the bicep curls in the world. Like, what? what's the point of having this meeting? Like, they out-recruited us. They have filthy athletes and an amazing team this year and you were with you were within winning that game and we probably played the best game and <clears throat> what it falls back on is not scheme or anything like that we were healthy throughout the entire game which like honestly we probably shouldn't have been with how much better their athletes were that year and we talked about how their biceps weren't big enough it's like man what are we doing here yeah it, it's interesting <clears throat> i will say with like the compartmentalization it allows for those outlets on the level of the coach like you get because it's more compartmentalized, you can blame strength and conditioning. You can blame sports medicine. I also, I do find it interesting when people blame sports medicine for injuries because it's like <laughs> their job is to help people get back. But if you're loading the crap out of your athletes and doing a horrible job from a load management perspective with practice, like it, it almost gives you, anyways, it, I just, I think that the way that it is, yeah, I mean, again, I don't know what you could do to change it on that level. But again, that's where the private sector is just so much more different because everything, you wear so many more hats. Jeremy, I did want to get your take quickly. I mean, you you lived in a very different world. You had 15 sports. I mean, you probably didn't even have the chance to run into some of these problems. You almost had a completely different issue with with all of that. I mean, it was probably a breath of fresh air to be able to work with athletes in, on, on kind of more of that. I, I'd imagine there was a lot more, um, of, it's a lot more personable versus having 15 teams where you can have like your own groups and your own setting the way that you create it. I feel like the uh, being in the private sector with, with the, you know, I have a bunch of different kids from different sports who are all tra- kind of training at the same time. So there's a little bit more, I guess, um, you got to be, you know, a little bit prepared ahead of time, you know, to be able to present the things that they need in a workout. And I feel like I'm always kind of just bouncing around from person to person, you know, you know, doing like just trying to help them make sure they're, they're getting what they need as far as their training program and, you know, the sport they play or any injury history, stuff like that. 
you know, whereas like, yeah, at the college level, like there was teams I didn't see, like some of the track track girls, like they would come in like seven in the morning before I, before I would even get there because I ended up being coming in a little bit later and staying later. So some of the, some of the programs, like I would write, and then we would have interns sort of like there early to present them to the athletes, you know? So, but then there was other teams that I was really like super, like men's basketball was like my main team. So I was like with them all the time, I would see them four days a week. So it was interesting too, because like talking about injuries, I was kind of clued in on like when I first got there, like all oh, the coach, the coaches are really like, you know, he runs them to death and they do so much conditioning and, you know, he wants them to be the toughest, mentally toughest, you know, you know, all that baloney on the court. And and so I was clued into like, you know, make sure that you're, when you start working with them, you know, like the kid's injury history and how they move and all that. So I, when I first got there, I actually did like, um, it's not the FMS, but it's, uh, Kelvin Giles, like physical competence assessment. And so like, I just put them through like all these kind of batteries and, you know, look, take their ankle mobility and hips and, you know, shoulder mobility and things like that, just to be like, all right, I went to the coach and presented it to him be like, listen, this is what I saw in this guy. This is what I saw in this guy. Cause like, I didn't want him to ever come back and be like, oh, you know, so-and-so knees hurts because you're doing too many squats at the gym. Like I brought that to his attention beforehand. And, uh, I just want him to, him to know that, you know what I mean? And that, that I knew because like, you know, they would, they would have three hour practices and, and then they have like these, uh, individual workouts where it's like supposed to be like, just maybe like two athletes and the coach and they were supposed to be like skills training. So I went to watch one day and it was like, they just got, you know, it was just more of the same, just driving them into the ground. You know what I mean? They're doing shooting drills, but they're exhausted. Like you don't ever feel like that in a game really. You know, like I used to tell my coach that too, like my football coach, like, I never feel like I'm dying in a game when I'm going out to catch a pass. Like I'm pretty recovered <laughs> between reps. Like we don't have to run to death, you know? So that's, uh, you know, I think, I think the big difference is, is that, um, you know, now I don't have to worry so much about like what, um, you know, what he's thinking or the head coach or the, or anyone kind of above you. Now it's being in my own facility. I can, I can make the decisions that I think, you know, as Austin said, you can make the, those decisions that you, uh, need to make and you know not have to worry about who's looking over your shoulder yeah let's start moving to the next question let's just start with you jeremy and that's yep. and that's the big this is the big theme to me i want this podcast to be more uh, more so than you know talking about the experiences in the the structured sector college i, I want to learn how you guys have evolved like what has changed since you moved to the private sector that wouldn't have changed if you kept doing what you're doing like what are some of the big ways that you have changed as a coach and then even as a a person by being in the private sector now? Well, for one, I, I kept going younger and younger. You know, like when I first opened the facility, it was mostly high school. And then I slowly started like, it was like every time, every time I worked with someone, I realized like, oh, like if, if I just had this kid a few more years, a few years earlier, would make a huge difference. You know what I mean? And so I just started going younger and younger, realizing that like there's a process and, you know, whether it's like phys ed to kind of athletic development to strength conditioning, whatever, whatever, like things you want to call it, there is like a sort of this long-term athletic development thing. It's not beautiful. It's not like super organized and it's not, you know, it's not as great as they make it sound in all the books, but it is it's there. And so I sort of, as I learned more about it, I, I went younger and younger because I realized like you can really make a difference early on. So, and then, you know, just being a dad of four kids and, and having coached for so many years, I'm just like so much more laid back than I used to. And so much more patient, you know, like I realized like you don't have to learn everything in a day or even a week. You got plenty of time to do those things. And uh, so you might come in and see some of the kids that we train it and you would probably shake your head because they look God awful. But I can tell you like a couple of years down the line, they're going to look, they're going to look good. They're going to hit puberty and they're going to grow and they're going to get stronger and they're going to get more coordinated and things are going to come together for them. You know, so the idea is to implement and put those, make sure you're teaching those skills in place now. So when they, when they really need it, when they get older, not so much of doesn't have to, they don't have to look great right now, I guess, you know, so that's definitely it. And then I've, having coached high school football and coached youth football and all that stuff now, and I've coached little league baseball and Babe Ruth baseball and travel basketball, you know, I realize too, it's like strength and conditioning is awesome. Getting stronger and doing training is good. But like I've gone out, we've gone out against kids who just just studs, and they killed us. You know what I mean? It's like those kids don't do anything but just go play basketball every day. You know, so you know, obviously you can make improve uh, improvements in performance, but at the same time, you got to go out and practice your sport, and you got to do it a lot. So you know, probably those are, probably those are the. I used to think strength conditioning was everything. Like, man, if we just train hard, we're going to dominate. 
<laughs> you know, we're just going to be so much more explosive and faster than everyone and stronger. And it's like, well, that's great. But if you don't have the skill of the sport in place, you're not doing anything. So that's, that's definitely, um, I probably do less strength conditioning now and more like sports skills training for sure. Yeah. I love that. I think, um, just quickly before you other, you other two go, I, I, I think that every coach and especially and now that you got, you know, Austin, you were talking about like every D1 head coach should be forced to take, if you could, two to three months to train like five and six year olds. And, and you have to, and they'll very quickly re- like, it's just, I mean, hopefully you'd at least open up your awareness too to what those kids respond to, you know, cause it's, it's that piece of the five and six year old is still there later. It's not like being a kid completely goes away and now you just only grind. It's, um, it really changes everything. I was just going to say there was a story about Sean Payton who, when he got kicked out of the NFL for a year, he had to go coach. He coached his son's football team or some relative of his, he had coached in the youth football. And, uh, you know, they got to play this team that runs this old school, like single wing offense. It's like the most ridiculous offense to try to like the ball, like rolls on the ground. And like one guy runs, it's all misdirection. And like, you don't know where the ball's going. You don't know where the, who the, who has the ball. And like, this is Sean Payton. Like he's an NFL coach. He should be able to go up against this team and, and stuff them. And it was just, it go, it went to sh- like, they lost. They couldn't, they couldn't stop. They couldn't stop the single wing. It was like one of those things that it was like, you know, this, this old, this dad, it's probably this dad who coaches his son's team and, you know, probably never got past high school football, but they, they went out and, and they beat this NFL coach. So it's just, a, it's a funny, funny story because about that stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. All right. Austin and Jake. Yeah, I think the like the biggest thing is it's just more re- real. Like one of the things Jake talks about is like now the people come to you, uh, which is like it makes everything so much easier. Like I like in the college sector, like if you're trying to implement new stuff, you're trying to do it like you're going to get some pushback by some people. And I think we actually did have pretty good buy in there. But I just saw it fall apart and with a lot of the other teams with some of the other coaches that were playing with some of the stuff. Uh, but it's like it's real. Like I go there and I'm just myself like I'm able to talk with these athletes. I'm not able to like. I'm not trying to push a university message, you know, like I'm not trying to say this is all for the like whatever their like university message is. I'm not wearing this like tight polo that they want you to wear, you know, like it's just it's just real. It's athlete focused. One of the biggest things like I continue to come back to is like that athlete is now your customer. It's not like winning. Winning is not your customer anymore. It's like that athlete is your customer. So does that athlete enjoy coming? You know, like, do they like you? (laughs) Because like as a division, like as a college strength coach, you can be a dickhead and like they don't got a choice. Like, you be a dickhead and they have to show up to your thing. If you do that in the private sector, like you're going to go out of business. So they have to enjoy coming. That has to be, yeah, you have to show. I think that's one of the cool things I like about the private sector is like, you kind of get rewarded for getting better at your job. Mm -hmm. Because like, if you're getting better results, you're finding more ways for athletes to come in and find them more ways for them to want to tell their friends or more ways to be engaged. Uh, You're getting, you have to actively get better at your job as you do that. You have to sharpen your sword and whatever it is, coaching rise, whatever way you want to go. But, you have to get results and you have to bring people in to like keep food on the table or the college sector. You don't have to do that. Like you're not rewarded at all. Like it's for getting better. You're just like, you're there as long as you're not effing kids up and you have a good, really like you could be the worst strength coach in the world and have a really good relationship with your sport coach, which is like a lot of, like a lot of places that I've seen. It's like, you can throw anything on the board. Then you don't have to get better. All you have to do is keep that relationship with the sport coach. So that's one of the really cool things I like about the private sector is like you actively get rewarded for becoming better. And I, I catch myself, I caught myself in the college sector. It's like, I really started to like, I don't want to say get pessimistic about it. But it's like, what's the point of like getting better at your job when it's like, it's not leading to anything. You're not going to get a raise. You're not going to, you're probably not even going to win more games because of that. You know, like at the end of the day, if we're not changing some of this other stuff. So I thought, I thought that was a big thing. And just, it, it's not babysitting anymore. You know, it's just, people are coming to you. They know what you're doing. And then that allows you to explore a lot of the stuff, but also do what you really think matters. Whereas in the college sector, it's like, all right, we got to do like some of it was like we're doing these like circle jerk like warm ups, and it's it's all it was is optics like, and that was a tough part too. Is the athletes knew it was optics like they they knew I didn't believe in like some of the stuff we were doing like some of the it's just they knew we had to do a warm up so like athletic directors when they're walking past could see them in a circle like doing jumping jacks because that's what they're used to seeing you know like that's just where we were at with that point. So the athletes knew it was fake. So then it really turned into certain. They're like, I knew it was fake. Cause like, what are we doing? We're just out here. So like eliminating all of that BS and just being able to like be yourself as a coach and kind of go forward from there, I think is, I think is the best part about the private sector for myself. I had to write these down. I have, I have three. It kind of took me a while to think of it. Cause that's a hard, that's a hard question. How have I evolved since I left? I can say 
when I did get there, we had an athletic trainer. He had been a strength coach. He was there, I think, 20 or 25 years, 30 years, whatever. Super intelligent guy. I learned a ton from him, but no passion at all for what he did. <laughs> like he just completely, because, because of all the people you're working for, you're working, you're getting a turnover of head coaches, athletic directors, new athletic trainers. And it's just, there's so many people you have to work with. You have all this knowledge and they don't even care. It doesn't even, doesn't even do anything at the end of the day. So I saw him. Um, and he had a wife and kids. And then I saw myself coming in and I'm like, I'm going to spend 24 hours a day here if I have to, like, I'm going to, I'm going to give so much more attention to these athletes than you do. And I had that at first. And then year two, it was a little bit less year three, a little bit less. And I just saw myself going down and down. And I'm like, I'm going to turn, I'm going to be exactly like him if I stay here for 10 years. So I, I, I was aware enough to realize that. And then also you guys can probably to sitting in an office as a strength coach or sitting in with coaches or sitting with other trainers there's so much complaining you spend so much time complaining about athletes or complaining about other things and um i just was like i'm spending two hours every single day complaining like what am i doing <laughs> um this is it's wasting my life so i got rid of that that was like the one so that's n- number one there's just less complaining in life because you, there's nothing for me to complain about because it's all on me. I have an mm-hmm. online business or if I'm going to work privately, it's all my fault. If I'm going to complain about something, it's on me. So that, that was the thing. And then secondly is because I have more time. Like when I was at Youngstown, I think I had one week before, before the summer, one week at the end of the summer where I could leave. And it was kind of frowned upon if I did leave because they're like, we still have athletes, we should be training them. But that was the time I had to travel. And now that I'm done, I can travel. And, and they say you should never meet your heroes. So like I've been able to meet all my heroes. And they're the same. It's like, you think these people that are at the pro level or at a power five school strength coach, that they're so much better than you. They're the same freaking people. So it's been great to meet these people because you realize if someone is more successful, whatever that means, or someone's making more money, they're the same as you. They just maybe do things a little bit differently or they have it better figured out than you do. So um, that'd be my second thing is I've been able to go meet everyone I want to meet. And then the third is that I just have time and energy to focus on what I want to focus on, which for the whole last year has been the figuring out the patellar tendinopathy. Mm-hmm. So it's like interview as many people as I can on the load side of patellar tendinopathy and the biomechanics side of patellar tendinopathy. And um, I can just focus on that. So I'd be, I really just looking at where I was when I was at Youngstown is like my knowledge then was so inferior to what it is now. And I've, yeah, so those are my three things. Like no complaint, a lot less complaining in life. I have time and energy to focus on what I want to focus on. And I've been able to travel and go and, and meet all these people that I want to meet. Quickly, I wanted to let you know about the chance to try out Performance Herbalism for only a few dollars shipping costs and get one of Lost Empire Herbs' flagship products, Pine Pollen, for free. Switching to an herbal emphasis in my supplementation has been a life-changing switch for me. Just as nature is by design balanced and sustainable, I believe that the more natural our diet and our supplementation is, the better. I love and use several Lost Empire Herbs products that boost not only my energy, but also my strength. These include Chiliagit Resin and the Phoenix Formula. You can check those out by heading to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly and grab 15% off. If you're on the fence about the power of herbalism, I have a great offer for you, which is that you can get free. You do pay a few dollars shipping but you can get free pine pollen. Pine pollen is an herbal powerhouse that is a hormonal and energy booster packed with nutrition. It's actually part of the Phoenix formula. And you can get that for free uh, along with the normal shipping fee at justflypinepollen.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, for, for very short notice questions, I've, I'm impressed you, you came up with the answers that quickly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, yeah, and Zach Evanesh, when he, I don't know if he mentioned this when he was on the show, but he, he, Shared it, I think, on either a message to me or just in general. And it was uh, the book called The Willpower Myth. And I forget who wrote it. But it basically says that you, like, we only have so much willpower. And we are a product of our environment. When we step away from the comfort of a a fixed job, and this isn't just college strength and conditioning, this is any job, you're kind of walking off the cliff, you know? And now you have to, like, with all the things you wouldn't have done before, even if you had a free time all day, now you have to do all those things. You have to evolve. You have to find a way to keep athletes in your gym. And uh, Michael Zwiefel said this, like similar to um, what you guys were talking about. I think, uh, Austin, you, you were saying too, like, you know, you can do just when you are in the college sector, you could do anything. Like, I mean, as long as your head coach is happy with what's happening and you're not like, then the athletes don't hate you completely. 
<laughs> you you can do a lot more just normal, I guess, or, or what's expected. But when you're in the private sector, athletes have to have fun. And it's funny because I think that a lot of people would be like, oh, well, that's you. Why are you they having fun? They should just be working harder. They need to be getting stronger and do checking all the boxes that, we're, that we think by tr- modern training theory that they are supposed to check. And that's what this is. But it's almost like, I mean, and, and I will say, you know, sometimes like in marketing, like I, I'm in the private sector, so I study marketing now. Like sometimes marketing is, oh, survey the audience and see what they want. But sometimes that doesn't work. Like Apple didn't do that. And so sometimes, sometimes you have the feeling inside of you, you know what they need. So all, I guess all I'm saying is I think that people who have left and people, and it's not even about leaving. To me, this isn't about college strength and conditioning as much. It's not about leaving. It's more about doing the thing that you were meant to do, you, and evolving the way you were meant to evolve. And I just think when you don't have the safety net, when you have to step off that cliff, it's like, oh, this is really important. Holy crap. And when Michael talks about have, the kids have to have fun to want to come back. You know what? That's really damn important. And, and, and you, you, you could go your whole career in college strength and conditioning and never get that. You never be forced to have to get that because it's not part of the description. Again, I, I, I'm not begging on like, I, I think you can have a great experience in college strength and conditioning. But I guess what I'm saying is I think that the forced evolution sometimes of being on your own can really facilitate some of those uh, different purposes. Yeah. And like Jake mentioned, I thought that's like something really is like you have the time and energy to do it. And that was like during COVID, during COVID is probably the first lockdown was like what solidified my like, I'm going to go private sector just because I had so much more time and energy just throughout my day just to pursue something that I was actually interested in. Like Jake mentioned, like it's knees for him. Uh, and mine was, I was going to go into more of that play and just movement. And like, how do you, how to become a better mover? Cause I was a shitty mover. I was like, all right, I'm sick of like moving like this. Like let's, let's go and fix that. But you, you have so much more time and energy to pursue that. And then when you pursue something that you're like actively passionate about actively, like it, and then it stops feeling like a bunch of work. Like I wouldn't be able to read the studies that Jake reads just because I have no interest in like, <laughs> uh, the battalion, you know, like I, I have no interest in it. Like I, I don't have the issue. Uh, I don't jump high enough to probably have the issue, you know, like I, I am not interested. So I wouldn't be able to read that. Whereas like what I'm super interested in, I can read all day, like it's nothing. And then that gets you it, like kind of, I, I think about it, like it weaponizes yourself. And when you weaponize yourself, you get rewarded for that in the private sector. But like that time and energy thing is a big piece because like you talk to like a strength coach in the college sector of like, all right, what are you passionate about? Like, what are you going? It's like, dude, you're working 80 hours a week. Like, it doesn't matter what you're passionate about. Like, you, you have no energy for that. And you don't even a lot of times they don't even know because they're, they're so stuck in the grind. And even if you really enjoy it, like Jake mentioned, like I felt myself doing the same thing. That burnout rate is like year one. I'm like, hell yeah, let's go session. And by year three, I was like, oh, my God, like we got four sessions a day. Like, <laughs> can we make that two? you know, like two of the sessions aren't going to let, you know, so like trying to keep that passion and energy up and then pursuing the thing that you like is is how you weaponize yourself to be like the expert in like what Jake's an expert in. And then in turn, that gets you paid because that's one of the things big, big things in the private sector you hear about is like people don't get paid in the strength in the strength sector. Like you can't get paid. It's like there's money to be made there. There's a lot of money to be made in the field. It's just getting good at what you want to get good at. And the only way to get good at it is if you get addicted to a certain subject or addicted to something that you can turn into a product. Yeah. Jeremy, I want to take it back briefly to what you were talking about. And I get this and I've seen this more and more and more. And especially as uh, like Michael Zwiefeld said when he was on last, he's like, all right, you need everyone should at least coach pro at some point and youth and like like those polarities, like you see where it ends and you see where it starts. And I think that sometimes... I think there, there can also be like a stigma. Like if you're not coaching pro, if you're not coaching college, like you haven't made it. You know what I'm saying? And as I hear you talk, and in the, as I've been more immersed in youth sport myself, uh, and I, because a lot of the private sector is, is youth, you know, it's, it's a lot more youth in general pop than it is college kids that come in and, and pros that come in. I mean, some people can do that. But I guess, Jeremy, one question I had for you is as you, because you've been in 12 years where, where you're working with the youth. And so you can see them develop up the line, which I think that's one of the things as the private sector evolves that I'm more excited to gather these. I mean, it's going to be anecdotal at first, but the more that we can gather, I think the better we can see. Because you can see if you missed this window at six to 10, you know, what happened. And I guess what I ask is, as you've learned, I mean, how much like a, a, someone who's working with athletes in college or even late high school, like how much can you make up? Like if a kid missed these windows where they weren't just playing and, and doing the right things, I mean, how much can you get back as you see it? I mean, I think that's probably why like there's, there's probably so much, you know, I think every couple of years, there's always like something new and fancy that 
happens in strength and conditioning that everyone's chasing. You know, for years it was like FMS, and then it was like everyone was talking about ankle mobility, and then other someone else was talking about thoracic spine mobility, and then you know, there's always like some hot thing, hot thing going on in, in strength and conditioning. But I do think like if you don't, I for, as far as like um, especially with boys. You know, if you can train them and teach them kind of these basic movement skills right before they hit puberty and they grow like crazy, I think you're really helping them out, helping them in the long run a lot, you know, because they'll, they'll, what happens is, is like, if you teach them how to squat and sort of hinge and lunge and get in these good positions and just kind of know how to stop and start and also kind of do it in like a sort of a chaotic reactionary or just get them used to that, those type of environments, you know, when their body grows, they're going to continue to hold on to those things. Whereas like if an athlete never were exposed to those things, I think it's a little bit harder. Obviously, you know, everyone's different, but I, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of like good athlete, you know, fairly athletic kids who specialize say in one sport. And then they don't come to me until maybe sophomore, junior year in high school. And I feel like their body is sort of morphed into that sport, which is fine. That happens. But I think like if they were exposed to sort of basic movement skills earlier, they probably would have been better off. You know what I mean? As far as like strength wise and being able to hold on to that flexibility, their mobility that, that you have when you're a kid, you know, cause you can just kind of, if you continue to, if you continue to train those patterns and those things throughout your growth spurt, you're going to, ha- you're going to hang on to them. Cause you're just, just, just like, you just, even though they're growing, you're still putting that input in, you know, there's still that input of, of the, of the training going into them. So I don't know if you can't make it up totally, but I, I do think you, uh, you know your athletes are way better off starting right kind of right before that that big growth spurt. You know, I know, I know that uh, if you read like Drabic and you know athletic skills model, there those the big push there is like kind of develop coordination in that sort of like six to twelve. I guess you could probably go like six to like age fifteen, really, but really it's like six to twelve where you really want them to be exposed to just as everything the wide a wide variety of not only sports but you know basic movements and you know gymnastics and and swimming and skiing and playing organized sports and games made up games stuff like that you know those are those kind of golden years and i guess and if you ever want if you want to kind of even make it smaller those really golden years are between the ages of like 10 and 12 that's where you really see that skill development come on so i've had great success like the kids that have gone through that period with me and I was able to teach them and they, we did all those types of training. We I put them in those training environments. I feel like those kids now that are in high school and college, they're really good movers. You know what I mean? I can't say that they're going to be great at their sport. Cause then, you know, that's the whole other side of it. Like how much do they go out and practice their sport? But I can tell you that like they move well, you know, and I feel like that's, that's kind of my job. Cool. Austin, Jake, I'm going to uh, frame a, a different version of that question for you guys. Cause I think, you know, we all have our own maybe specific nuances in the directions we've gone. But I think as we do branch out, I think we also see more of a need. Like, I mean, Jeremy, you just saw what a massive need there was for just, just physical competency in, in youth and, and how youth are coached and brought up. And um, Austin, Jake, tell me a little bit about as you guys have gotten more into your own thing, like what's the biggest need that you two see in the areas that you guys have, like Austin, you said, I'm really like play and games and Jake, you working on the knee and uh, tendon pain. Like, what are the biggest things that you guys, you two see as like, this is a huge need. And, and then maybe tell me a little bit about like what you guys are hoping to, I, I didn't put that as a question. I'm sorry. Uh, but like, how are you guys, how are you guys seeing, you guys are obviously on the younger end of it too. Where do you guys picture yourself moving as per the need in you guys as individual uh, areas of interest? Yeah, I, I can start. I th- I'm probably very much with Jeremy on this one. Just a lot of that play and movement based stuff, just moving their bodies like, I can, I'm almost like Jeremy talks about how like when they don't have that that age like they haven't done it within that age range like you can tell later it's it's almost a hundred percent with a college athlete like you can tell if they danced they did gymnastics or they did some sort of martial arts or parkour as a kid like you can tell walking in like it's just their fluidity of everything and I, it was it was a big thing it's a bias for myself too just because like my, my background was very just weight like you know just weight room and then I just started to move like that and having to go back and teach myself some of the stuff which is it's really eye opening to see how much slower the skill acquisition piece is for people that haven't gotten used to skill acquisition, you know, like Mm -hmm. they haven't, they've they've just mastered one sport or one position, which was mine, uh, like kind of background and a lot of these kids background, but kids that have done gymnastics or just any movement based background, and they've mastered different skills, they pick up new skills faster. And that's what I really look for. And what I think 
for me and how I view like the field of sports is like, how can you get pe- people better, the athletes better at picking up new skills? How can they, they catch a ball better? How can they throw a ball better at different platforms? And then how can you get them better at learning these new skills quicker? And that's where I think the sports performance model can kind of go to like make them better movers, but also make them better learners of movement itself. And that's what I see the best athletes kind of do. It's like two people can sprint in a straight line perfectly. All right. Now what happens if it's, it's funny, like Jake and I put, we put hurdles, like as a joke at velocity, we're sprinting over these hurdles. It's like, all right, who can sprint over these hurdles now? Like with just a tiny variable added in and like people that are just aren't very good at picking up like so you want to call them like the best athletes in the world uh, they just have very good straight line speed this their drop off is going to be insane because it's a new stimulus and they're not that quick at picking it up where as an athlete that maybe is just slower in that straight line but is just a better athlete in general like your typical starter on the field he's going to pick that up and he's going to have way less of a drop off so just exposing them to those kind of environments and create like learners of movement people that can learn movement and understand how to master movement which i think is then you can take that to your sport practice, which is like I how I be, view that kind of branching of the strength, like training in quotations and the, the, the skill practice in quotations. Yeah. So your question, yeah, the biggest, like the biggest need. And yeah, for the, for the knee pain thing, it's like, I think there was a study that if you early specialize, your chance of patellofemoral pain is like twice as much as it was before. Hmm. So I think that like, the the general movements is good but the thing is like if you're if i'm a dunker i want to dunk basketballs i'm just going to kill my patellar tendon i'm not going to get a achilles tendinopathy or a hamstring tendinopathy i'm going to get a patellar tendinopathy or a quad tendinopathy because it's just overuse of that one thing and i had uh greg hawthorne on my podcast recently and i was i asked him because one of the things they say the researchers say is like humans get get tendinopathy and horses get tendinopathy (laughs) and i guess dogs get tendinopathy but it's like why are these the only mammals getting it and Greg is like, well, because we were either we're lazy, humans just don't do anything. And then it's like, I'm going to go play basketball. And then you blow up your tendons because you're lazy. <laughs> or that you're trying to, what, what should take, if your genes are meant to jump 20 inches, and it could probably take hundreds of years for that to turn into like 40 inch vertical, you want to get 40 inches in the next two, in the next two years, you know? So it's like, either you're super lazy or you're just killing yourself mm-hmm. and doing too much. So it's like, if you got the patellar tendinopathy, I think what's missing in that world is those people that have, have it are usually the basketball players where it's like everything you do on the basketball court is just killing your anterior knees. So it's like, get some, do something different. Get some stimulus from some other type of sport that's not going to kill your anterior knee, but it's still going to overload your body in a different way. And I, I think that's what's missing is like, you have the thing that you, if you love sprinting, it's like, you're probably going to run into a hamstring or an Achilles. You're probably not going to run into a patellar. So it's like, I don't know how you could fit that in to like get some variation, stimulate your structure, stimulate your nervous system, but do it in a little bit of a different way instead of just overloading this one thing because you love jumping so much, you're just going to kill your knees. So it's like, yeah, I think that's what's missing is like too big changes in load. People are too lazy and then they pick some up too fast. Or it's like, you just dunked five days this week. You shouldn't be doing that five days. You know, you should be doing it once or twice and slowly let your body adapt. Yeah. I love that you brought in like the, you know, with the, with the knee pain thing, cause this all ties together is, I mean, so much of, I mean, a lot of things I think can be, end up being reactionary. Once you get to the, the high school, late high school, college pro level, like you're reacting to something that didn't happen earlier, <laughs> you know, they were an athlete should have been doing more movements. And ultimately I think a lot of it, and even in college too, it is like, you know, Jeremy, you mentioned it, like getting more patient as you get older. Dan Cleaver talked about when he was on, talked about gardening, like he's, He's an educator for St. Mary's, a coach, and he does gardening. Like, and I feel like maybe the ultimate trifecta, you know, you talk about what we all do down the line. If we all coached youth sports, uh, because I think it's hilarious that a pro coach is getting beat by like a youth coach, right? Like that should tell you something. But I feel like we should all coach youth sports and we should all garden. Like, I think if we all did those things... I just think the world of sport would be such a better place. Like it's, it's, I think we all inevitably get to that point on some level. I mean, it's, I think that it would be hard to, to, to talk to like, you know, a vibrant, like, like elderly person who's like 80 or 90 and still you know, going at it and not have them give you something with all that experience, tell you about like the importance of slowing down and being patient. And I do think in the college sector, like it's, it's a grind there. It's like, all right, we're in eight hour, we're in 20 hour, you got this class, we're going to, you know, we got the, and it's like, 
I think it's sometimes more rare that you would see things really slow down. I think the, the the most patient process I saw is actually probably working with men's tennis at Cal. That sport's like country club, kind of laid back, you know, kind of chill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys have been seeing your own sport nuances, but like, it, it's like almost like college is a microcosm of what you get the whole ride up at, along the way where people just lack this general patience and and then it manifests in the things that we have to try to fix later, or the coach asked us to get the Theragun out, you know, or whatever. Well, uh, Jake, Jake and I talk about that too. It's like, just like a lot of coaches just kind of need girlfriends, you know, like a lot, a lot of the straight coaches on, like, they're, they're like saying these things and it's like, this is what matters. This is what matters. This is what matters. It's like, you're not talking to your athletes. So you're not talking to anybody outside of the weight room. If you are saying these things, like a lot of the mental toughness grind, it's like, you have never once talked to your athletes. You have no idea what they're doing, you know? And then it comes to like the Theraguns and injury stuff. We had a kid that got injured and he had eight more pizzas in the last three days than he had hours of sleep. And he, of course he got injured. And it's like the, the, the ATs were having like a hissy fit about like, how about his hips being misaligned? I was like, did you have even one bit of discussion with this guy? He was a like six string defense alignment that went out and partied for the last three days. He slept four hours and ate five pizzas, you know, like, come on, man, like that is what we should be looking at. But it's like, we're so stuck in our own, like in our own box. And like, we just have zero out. I, I don't think it was Bobby. What, who was it? Somebody came on and was talking about that. It's like the strength coach is like all strength coaches. They, they, they stay all day in their weight room and then their friends are other strength coaches. And then their hobby is lifting. And it's like, there's, there's just no outside perspective there. And that that's why it's like the gardening thing. Like that's why gardening helps so much is because it's just so far out. It's like, have a different passion, have a different hobby, have something that takes you just at least a little bit outside of the weight room. So you're not just so stuck in like three by 10 is the only thing that matters. And like, that's what you're dreaming of. And it's like, man, like we're, we're, we're missing, we're missing a lot of what's like just blatantly right in front of us with the humans. If you just go talk to them. Yeah. That was Kyle Dobbs who said that. Kyle Dobbs. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It was Kyle. Yeah. I think um, the college strength and conditioning curriculum should have like, or exercise science they should have gardening, they should have music. Music would be a good one. Or dance. <laughs> Re restructure all this, you know, like PE. It's funny because I mean, Jeremy, like if you were going to be a coach, like back in the day, you took PE. I think it's actually right. crazy that now you take exercise science and you have to get your master's in basically the same thing. Like, I feel like this is how many people would not just be better off just taking PE, you know? And, and I find when I was a student, I didn't, I was like, oh, PE is almost like, there was a version of PE when I was in college called Physical Activity and Sports Studies, or PASS, which was actually PE without the educational <laughs> classes, which I thought, so you passed. That was the joke. But I mean, I, I think I kind of looked at it like, oh, I'm taking exercise science. Like, this is somehow superior to physical education. I'm like, no, I'm like, no, it's not. Like, now I got to learn all this stuff later. <laughs> like, it, it's, um, I just thought that was so interesting. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Jeremy. I know you've gotten a lot really into the physical education portion of the process and um, just how important that is if we were going to rewrite some of the books on coaching education. Well, I think if you look at like a lot of the European coaches, a lot of them, like they went to like a physical phys ed school, like some of the, the, uh, old Eastern Bloc countries, it's like Poland and stuff like that. Like those guys, like, I think it was Drebeck. He's like a master in PE or, you know, went to some, you know, PE type school, which was basically like the whole curriculum was, was from, you know, you, you're basically undergrad till you know, you're a doctor is in physical education. You know what I mean? Where here it's like the only PE, the only people that take PE are like people who want to be PE teachers. When reality is, it's like, you know, there's probably, especially in this industry, the private industry, right? There's so many saturated with youth sports. It's almost like maybe some coaches will be better off having taken, you know, some type of minor or something in, uh, in, in phys ed along with the strength and conditioning type of uh, training. So I think um, a lot of the kids that come in, they, you know, they're not prepared to start lifting weights or, you know, doing these complex lifts, you know, that you are probably better off teaching them how to skip and crawl and mm -hmm. climb and hang and things like that first. So it's like, those things should be in place. And, 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 you know, you guys have probably heard me talk about it before. Like nothing drives me crazy, more crazy when I see a facility where like, you got a bunch of like fourth and fifth graders and they got a PVC pipe learning how to like overhead squat and clean and snatch. It's like, Oh, you know, we're, you know, do I don't even, I can't even get into it. It's like, you're just basically <laughs> training them like mini because you don't know, you don't know anything else. It's all, you know, is how to like lift weights. So you're, and you've been 
given these kids who you probably don't even want to be with, you want to be with older, older athletes, but you want to make some money off of kids. So you're going to train them like little adults. So you're going to put a stick in their hand and act like you guys are the Russians or the, or the Bulgarians learning how to do uh, Olympic style weightlifting. And it's like, if you knew how to work with kids that age, you know that that's not what they, and they invite you watch the video. The kids are bored as hell. You know, they're not even engaged one bit. They're not happy at all. Right. And so obviously, yeah, I'll, cause people are going to hear this on Twitter. And there's some people that are going to say like, my son crushes squats. He's like 10. And like, I get it. Like some people, there's some kids that enjoy strength training, but the majority of kids would much be rather, would much rather be running around, chasing each other, wrestling, climbing, playing a game, like give them some open space and some time. And the kids will be on the ground wrestling in one minute. You know what I mean? Like they'll make up their own game. If you just get, let them You'd be like, Hey, the rule is just like, don't hurt, hurt each other too bad. And, and let's make up, make something up. And the kids will do it on their own. You know what I mean? Cause they're kind of inquisitive little, little guys and mm-hmm. they, and they want to, you know, they like to do stuff. So yeah, the, uh, like I said, I, I, whenever I see, like, I saw one day, like this guy having like these like little second graders, they're doing like weighted carries, like farmer, farmer walks. <laughs> I'm like, dude, like that is just the worst worst like this, those not one kid wants to be doing that right now not one kid but their parents are there cheering them on because they do the class <laughs> after and so they you know try to make their parents happy which is just god awful sorry i went on a tangent there <laughs> that's okay it's funny i could see your eyes just like uh <sighs> like this is the most painful thing that we all cringe like those of us and as i as you guys are talking i think the themes that are just constantly going on in my head like all these alarm bells like it's like it's awareness. It's a lack of awareness. Like those parents have no awareness of what being an athlete actually is. And it's this over compartmentalization. And if we would actually just spend time like across the board in different like I actually always joked when I was at Cal, I, I joked with my boss that the uh, the strength and conditioning staff and the sports medicine should like switch jobs for a week you know, every now and then just for fun. I think the, <laughs> not that we could, you know, from licensure perspective, we can't get away with that. But, you know, like I just just to experience what other people do with a sport coach and strength coach. I don't know. I just think it'd be we don't. We live in such an interesting world where I was reading, um, it was called the Checklist Manifesto. I don't, it has not much to do with strength and conditioning, but it was more how, like, just how specialized medicine is. And that's a little, that's a different ballpark. I mean, I'm sure to be like the, the, an eye doctor, you have to be pretty darn specialized. Like, I get it. But the way the world seems to go is just like this insane specialization. And then no one, like, visits the other box and, and experiences anything outside of their box. And maybe it's part, that's part of the way that society has created that, sadly enough. And so that's where it's like, you know, when you jump out, you can get in the private sector, you can be your own superhero. You know, you can take on all the different qualities. You get to experience the different. And to me, I think I, I feel like I, I'd be curious what you guys think, but I feel like the number one thing is just different ages at first and, and, and observing different ages. Like, like Jeremy, you said, like the kids who get there before the, the co- like there was a, like I'm about to see red here. Like there was a, a coach who contracts out of the facility I train athletes at and he comes in with his speed ladders and his cones and. You know, like here come the six to eight year olds and they're all like goofing off and doing cartwheels and playing tag. And then he comes out, he's got like the whistle kind of and there. He's like taking them through these sprint drills and ladder. And I'm just like, every time I see him, like, I can't look like I can't. I can't. This is like, you know, a traumatic event that I like. <laughs> uh, it's so and, you know, he actually isn't there anymore. Thank God. But like, it's so I- I'm just like blown away. But like, you have to have awareness. Like if you have awareness, you'll watch what those kids are doing before you roll out the ladders. And you're like, oh, wait, this is maybe this is what they should be doing. You know, yeah, so you might not, you, you might not even have to intervene. Yeah. Just let them go. Nope. <laughs> like some days I just let them go. I just stand there and I talk to a parent or something and the kids just, they take care of themselves. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's crazy. Exactly. So yeah. and that, that's where it's like that. The biggest thing for me with that is like the elimination of like the self-importance, you know, like, I think that's huge. in like our field, like once you're able to do that and just realize like you, mm-hmm not everything like your three by 10 program is not what's going to make that kid an NFL athlete. Cause that, I mean, that's when you start in the field, that's what you're taught. It's like, if you follow this, you will be an elite athlete, you know, and then you follow it and you run kids through it and you like have this belief, but it's like this super paradox of like, you know, it doesn't work. You're like, I can't like you, we can't just pick a kid and run him through this perfect program. And he's going to be an NFL athlete. Like you can't even predict who's going to win gold with Olympians, you know, like in that setting. So like eliminating the self-importance behind it and just realize like, I think it's Kier's like quote. It's like you are a speck of dust, uh, teaching PE on like a mm-hmm. spinning rock in space. You know, like just looking at it from that perspective helps a little bit too. Is like because then you can like 
once you eliminate that self-importance a little bit, you can't just take a step back and just see what's happening and like, let them do the session, like keep it athlete led. Oh, the athlete likes that, but you wrote down this on your sheet of paper. It's like, who really gives a shit about your piece of paper? Like you're supposed to run 10 sprints today, but they, they, they like this uh, curve sprint thing and they're chasing each other and they're still getting a lot of work done. I, I think that's big just like, and it was personally too, just because like growing up, you just think you're, you're, you're fed all these programs and you're fed all these studies and you're fed through your entire exercise science degree. It's like, they hit this knee angle and if they hit this program and they hit this amount of like newtons through the ground and these force plates you know like it, they're going to be an elite athlete and then you just look and it's like that's not the case like we're, it's a straight up paradox but yet we continue to preach it so and again it's it's so everybody keeps their job it's so the exercise science department keeps their job it's so the like biomechanists like keep their job it's so the strength coaches keep their job their ats teach, keep their job but it's like we know it's not true like maybe it's just time to admit a lot of the what we're saying isn't true and then it allows us to eliminate the self-importance and then do what Jeremy's talking about, where you are taking that step back and being like, oh, this is this is perfect. This is what we could do today. Yeah. I love yeah. It. The uh, yeah. Jeremy with the, the the people like they only know strength. I had that. And it is insecurity. Awesome. Like once I once I became less insecure at the college because I was kind of on my way out, I guess I could not be insecure and be like, I don't even need this job. <laughs> um, but the uh, it's like all, you know, is strength. So it's like the best case I had was with back, back to the woman's soccer was I did, uh, I was doing a dynamic warm up with them and it's like, it was a good dynamic warm up, you know, let's do some jogging, backwards jogging, bear crawl lunges, you know, and then do some uh, sprints at the end for like central nervous system. And then we got in the weight room and our woman's soccer coach, he would come out there and watch and like, no one says a word. No one, no one's talking. No one's nothing. Cause like I was new with the team, the girls, it was probably a good setting because the girls were also like, all very quiet. I don't know why they just didn't, they just weren't a group of girls that talked to each other. I don't know in, in a setting like that. And Brian would be like, okay, you're preparing their bodies, but think of what you're doing to their brain. And it was, it was like that, that sentence for me, because he put it in such a way, he was so influential with me because he could kind of speak to me as, as the, the way I saw things. And it's like, dude, you're right. Like all I know is the body. I know how to prepare <laughs> the body for training and I know how to prepare the body to get stronger and everything. But it's like, what about their brains? And, um, I, that's where all the games came from. I just started doing games and warmups and I had one case too, where we were warming up on the same part. I was taking women's soccer on one side. I think we were playing a uh, spike ball. Oh, no, we were playing kickball. We were playing kickball. And then the softball team was warming up on the other end with the, the strength coach who only knows strength. And the softball girls are like, why aren't we doing stuff like that for our warm up? Cause they were doing like eight skips and uh, whatever. And he's like, we're not here for that. And then, you know, then they go and do the weight room stuff. But it's it. like, yeah, it, it either either you're insecure because you need to be the strength coach that knows how to warm up a body or you're just unaware that they also have a brain. And that is that is really important to not neglect in training. I love it. I'll kind of start closing this out. You know, Jake, something you said there, you said it a couple of times with like the soccer coach is I do feel like one of the amazing possibilities of being on the, at least the college level is. Like you can learn from an awareness perspective. You can learn from all the sport coaches that are not in strength. And I learned so much from being in the world of swimming. And I had, you know, I learned a lot from my boss in strength and conditioning. I, I mean, I just from a general leadership perspective and many other aspects of, of strength, and, strength and conditioning that I was not nearly versed on. But I learned so much from just the swim coaches and motor learning and swimming and spending time with them and watching swim practice. And I would have never got that you know, unless I was there, like, and, and that was, that's another thing, I guess, if I had to say, like, you know, if you're, if you're in the college sector, like, don't like, instead, if you traded the time complaining with spending time with the, find the sport coaches, you feel like are really, you know, on it and, and doing a good job and like, and observe them and have conversations with them. I mean, the, I know that was really valuable for me. So I, I mean, this to, podcast to be a podcast of like, you know, self-evolution, evolution, ev evolving the sport field, finding commonalities, so I think that that's definitely something that can lead when you're in a place where you have all these unique skill sets, let's get together and, and find the people who really can improve you and help you. And I, I just think that's another, that's a, that's a, uh, a really important opportunity, I think, for people who are on that level. So yeah, if you guys have any follow-ups or any closing thoughts at all, uh, I'd love to hear it. So we, we do have a few minutes if you guys want to, otherwise we can close it out. Yeah, I think branching off with that, I think that's like super important because if you talk because that, that's one thing you do, you like you get into it. It's like all oh, the sport coaches are dumb because they don't know the physical aspect. Sport coaches like this, like, no, they're not like go sit in one of those meetings and you'll be the dumbass. Like go sit in one of those meetings and they're talking about like what defense they're covering and what blitz is going to hit and why. And like you realize like how little you know about the sport that you're supposed to be training it for. And that it, it just comes back to disconnect. It's like 
the the sport coach thinks you're dumb because you don't know that aspect and you should know that aspect. I think that's a big thing in the strength conditioning world. It's like, we think we're super, super smart. And like, we, we have no idea what we're training them for. I'm not saying you need to have the PhD that sport coach, but you should have some knowledge in that sense. So the sport coach thinks you're dumb. The strength coach thinks the sport coach is dumb because the sport coach has no physical knowledge and they're running through there. But it's like the, you're, you're battling back and forth rather than like you said, just going to each other's meetings and seeing and like, oh man, like this is what they're experts at. This is why we're winning games. And then showing them how you could improve with the physical aspect. And just like, I think Jake, you, the, the good point is like, don't complain about it, but like just go there and just see it for what it is and then try to put it out there. And it, it, it's, it's very obvious. Like when you see it, like firsthand, how little a lot of the stuff that you, so like, I love the example. Like when I was a freshman at St. Thomas, I, we had a clean day. We, we were maxing out on cleans or something. And I cleaned 350 pounds and I was a fullback at the time and I got it up as a new PR. I thought I was like, okay, that's amazing. And this uh, linebacker, who's the second year linebacker, look, just biggest dad bod in the world. He missed 185 and he got 180, but it's like, it was like those like upright row 180 and these like totally muscle. It was, just, it was just horrible. And we go on the field that day and he lays me the F out. Like I've never been hit that hard in my entire life. And like, uh, th- we talk about like the, the opening my eyes opening to it's like okay there's just so much more there uh and that's just like eliminating the technical and tactical part it's just like the 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 understanding of the sport and how you leverage your body and then you expand that to the technical and tactical part by having conversations with the sport coaches and again i I think it just helps to open your eyes to like how many pieces really go into that and just i I, i'm gonna reiterate it like stop pretending like uh, our our high low model is what makes a difference and we just we, we know it like we know it, but it's, it's right in front of us, but we can continue to pretend like we don't know it for some reason, which is I'm, I'm not sure why. Like, I, I haven't figured out why we grasp onto the like it's Olympic lifts or not. It's unilateral or bilateral or not. It's like there's so much that goes into that. If you go to a sport coach and just talk to them about their sport and then you just look at the different levels of athletes physically, too. And I just think we're not looking at it in the, in that way. Yeah, we had a. So yeah, at Velocity this summer we had we had a few NHL guys, like like really good NHL guys, and um, it's like they're you got college guys who want to just like kill themselves, lift super heavy. These these pro guys they they're not like that. So it's like <laughs> that's not the that's not what that's not what is separating them. So going back to like college, I'm like I got to that point where I'm like who's who's really winning games here? Is it is it me as a strength? Am I helping as a strength coach? Is it the coaching staff and their model and whatever? And I'm like. It's probably the recruiting coordinator, you know. So I'm like, if you want me to look like a good strength coach, get a good recruiting coordinator, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look like a great strength, and I and I'm gonna have a lot of fun this year because we just have really good athletes. So so that that was a that was a tough pill to swallow. Of just like, if you get enough gifted athletes, you're probably gonna succeed. And I think where we can come in is like, let's do our best so that they don't get injured. You know, let's do some wise training practices. But yeah, that's those those are kind of my closing thoughts. Is like the best <laughs> athletes are the best, and we still don't know why they are that way but it's probably not because of the the model we have as a strength coach. Uh, yeah. On that pro athlete thing too, I think is something really cool is like, if you talk to a pro athlete, like just listen to what they're talking about. Cause you talk to the meathead, like college guy that you're talking <clears> about. <throat> and he's going to talk about like what I talked about in college. Like this is my lift. This is my bench. But you talk to the pro guy and it's like the level of understanding, <clears throat> like what sets them apart is the level of an understanding of the game. Like I talked to, we had some NFL guys at one of the internships we had and like not, they, they dreaded, they dreaded a lot of the workouts. And they just, they just were there to just like, keep their bodies in shape but when it would come to football like their knowledge of football like when they're breaking off routes what they're running their route against when they're going to look for the ball what they're doing like it, it's just a different it's a totally different piece and we're just not having those discussions at all with them like we're just telling them to clean a certain way or squat a certain way but like jake said like if you just listen to like the the, the experts at what they're doing like they're not talking at all about that and they're probably not even pushing themselves that hard in these aspects yeah, they're talking about golf while they're lifting. <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny, too, like, talking about college football. I always found it interesting, especially, like, some of those stud athletes, like, spring semester in college football, like, those guys are staying up late, partying, going out all the time, probably eating like crap after they go out. And every one of them would come home to my facility for summer and be jacked and lean and ready to go. Like every one of them. I'd be like, what did you do for the last like three weeks? Oh, we've been partying. We've been drinking. <laughs> but like they lift and they do like off season conditioning and running. But like their nights are a disaster. They go on spring break. Right. 
and these dudes still come home and they look unbelievable. They, they're huge. They're Jack. They're bigger than when they left me in the, in the winter time. You know what I mean? And it's just amazing just, you know, to be young and to be athletic and, and you just don't have all the answers. You know what I mean? It's just like, they would come home and I just would be blown away at like the shape <laughs> they're in and the things that they did to their body. Yeah, I love it. I just had to throw that in there. Sorry. It's just one of those things I always found interesting. Yeah. I think you always have to give credit to that. I think, uh, it makes me think of the quote too. Like if you don't try to take the credit for the victory as a strength coach, if you're not going to get, take credit for the losses. And I think right. that, that just even existing outside the fact that these are just amazing athletes. And yeah, uh, I, I love that. Like that, you know, to have the humility too, to be like, look, I don't even know all the things that really make you amazing at this, you know, and, and to think so often we think we can control that little piece so hard. It's just cool. Cool to talk about. All right, guys, I, I know this has been uh, an amazing uh, to chat with you all i really appreciate all of you taking the time to be here and have this conversation these are ones that i definitely uh, as all of these on the podcast grow immensely from and so i appreciate your time thank you guys for being here thanks for having us thanks thank guys thanks for tuning in to another show we'll see you all next week